Hi, and welcome to our special module on the MP3 audio encoder. MP3 is a shorthand for MPEG Layer 3, and MPEG is a shorthand for the Motion Picture Expert Group. And what this all means is that at one point in the 90s, a lot of people, a lot of experts, got together and agreed on a set of standards for video and audio compression and encoding. MP3 turned out to be the most used audio digital format for digital audio storage, uh, streaming and playback. And today a portable music device, thanks to the MP3 encoding, can store up to 30,000 songs, which really means you can carry your entire music collection with you everywhere. So in this video we will look at the technology behind the success of MP3, and we will describe in detail how the MP3 encoder works. You will see how all the tools that you have learned in our DSP class, from Fourier transform to filtering, from sampling to quantization, they all come together in this application. So how does the encoding and decoding process take place? Suppose you start with a discrete time sound signal X of N. This is processed by the encoder and converted into a binary string. The decoder will take that binary string and convert it back into a sound signal Y of N. The goal of this encoding and decoding chain is to reduce the memory requirements to store the sound waveform. And the real achievement of MP3 is its ability to greatly reduce the amount of data needed to encode a file. And this at a very reasonable trade-off with respect to sound quality degradation. The data reduction is determined by looking at the amount of memory that is necessary to store the output of the encoder and by comparing this quantity to the amount of memory that we should have used if we had wanted to store the original signal in uncompressed format. And remember that an uncoded raw audio file will require quite a bit of storage. For instance, if we sample at 48 kilohertz, which is the DVD standard, and we use 16 bits per sample, we will need 12 megabytes to store a single minute of audio in stereo. On the other hand, a high quality MP3 will require just 1.5 megabytes, which represents almost an order of magnitude in data reduction. To achieve this performance, uh, the coding has to be done in a very clever way. And one of the key ingredients in MP3 is a model of the human auditory system. So MP3 does not attempt to preserve the original framework, but rather it focuses on coding the elements of the waveform that are most important to our way of listening to music and hearing sounds. In particular, the distortion introduced by the encoder, the loss of information introduced by the encoding mechanism, is placed in parts of the spectrum of the original signal that we cannot hear. We will see that in more detail in just a minute. As we said, the origins of MP3 date back to the 90s when the Moving Picture Expert Group, in short MPEG, was set up by the International Standard Organization to develop algorithms and standards for audio and video compression. And the audio compression part of the standard, the MP3 protocol, had its origins in a set of compression algorithms that had been developed in the 80s by the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. We see a photo of the team here in this picture. The MP3 standard was quickly embraced by the industry and this widespread acceptance is what decreed its success, ultimately. Now let's try to understand how MP3 works using the simple block diagram. Your input signal, X of N, enters a bank of subband filters. There are 32 parallel filters that subdivide the input signal into 32 independent channels that span the full uh, spectral range of the input. Each channel is then quantized independently using a very clever method, and the quantized sample are then formatted and encoded in a continuous bit stream. The quantization scheme is clever because the number of bits allocated to each subband is dependent on the perceptual importance of each subband with respect to the overall quality of the audio waveform. In other words, 
some bands that are deemed by the psychoacoustic model not to be important or difficult to be perceived are allocated very few or no bits at all, whereas the most perceptually relevant subbands are allocated the bulk of the entire bit budget. The reason why we can safely allocate different amounts of bits to the different subbands is to be found in the so-called masking effect of the human auditory system. Suppose you have a sound with a strong sinusoidal component, as in this picture here. The blue line represents the spectrum of the sound, and here with the red dot, we indicate the strong sinusoidal component. When your ear listens to a sound like this, a masking effect takes place, whereby frequency components in the vicinity of the dominant peak are not heard unless they are louder than a given masking threshold. In this figure, for example, the masking threshold is indicated by the red dotted line, and what it indicates is that anything in the spectrum that falls below the red line will not be heard, and therefore can be removed without any loss of perceptual quality. Masking effects is something that we experience every day. Imagine being in a perfectly quiet room, like in your home at night. You can even hear your wristwatch ticking. But of course, you wouldn't be able to hear that noise uh, in normal conditions during the day when a lot of other auditory stimuli are reaching your ears. Although, if you were to record the audio environment and analyze its spectrum, you will see that it still contains the information about your wristwatch ticking. The shape of the masking threshold is a function of the loudness and the frequency of the dominant tone, and it has been determined experimentally by running a lot of listening tests with uh, human subjects. Masking in the human ear takes place within critical bands, and critical bands are portions of the spectrum that are treated by the ear as a single unit. Everything that happens within a critical band cannot be further resolved by the ear, so two different frequencies taking place in the same critical band are perceived as a single tone. There are approximately 24 critical bands in the human ear, and here is a picture of their distribution in frequency. As you can see, they get wider as we go up in frequency. They follow a logarithmic scale, which means that the resolution power of the ear is stronger at low frequencies, whereas at high frequencies we're less discriminant, and therefore when we quantize things across critical bands, we can probably fit more noise in the high frequencies than in the low frequencies. In the end, the purpose of the psychoacoustic model is to compute the minimum number of bits that we need to use to quantize each of the 32 subband filter outputs so that the perceptual distortion is as little as possible. In the end, we are given a non-uniform bit allocation, which will allocate fewer bits to the bands where the masking is strongest. Interestingly enough, the specifications of the psychoacoustic model are not part of the MP3 standard, which means that manufacturers of MP3 encoders can compete with better and better versions of their psychoacoustic model. In the end, the number of bits used for each subband is sent along with the quantized data to the decoder, so it doesn't really matter how this bit distribution has been generated. From the technical point of view, as you can imagine, there are a lot of fine details in the inner workings of the psychoacoustic model and the bit allocation procedure, and we will not have time to examine all of this in this presentation. But we can roughly sum up what happens inside a psychoacoustic model like so. First of all, remember that all processing is performed on subsequent windows of a given length. So the input signal comes in and the stream of input samples is cut into chunks of a given length, say 1,024 samples. An FFT is then used to estimate the energy of the signal in each of the subbands computed by the filter bank. For each subband, we try to distinguish between tonal and non-tonal components, components that have a strong sinusoidal shape and noise-like components. We have looked at masking for tonal components, but a similar type of masking takes place for non-tonal components, and we will have to take that into account as well. The individual masking effect for tonal and non-tonal components is computed for each critical band, and then these results are summed together to obtain a global masking curve for the audio frame that we're analyzing. This masking curve is mapped onto the 32 subbands, and the number of bits 
that we will use for each subband is computed as a function of the signal to mask ratio, the power of the signal versus the masking power for each critical band. Let's now talk about the implementation of the subband filtering in MP3. As we said, the input is split across a filter bank that contains 32 filters isolating different parts of the spectrum. These filters are implemented as 512 tap FIRs and they're followed by a 32 times down sampler to provide the independent subband samples. The filter prototype is a simple low pass with a cutoff frequency of pi over 64 and a total bandwidth of pi over 32. The different subbands are obtained by modulating the base filter with a cosine at multiples of pi over 64 and the resulting filter bank looks like this. We're showing the positive half of the frequency axis. This would be the first low pass filter um, with index zero. This is the second one, the third, the fourth, and so on, covering the entire spectrum. Now let's go back to the implementation of the filter bank. As you can see here from this block diagram, each branch in the filter bank comprises uh, an FIR filter of length 512 and a 32 time down sampler here. What this means, of course, is that 31 out of 32 output samples of this filter are discarded, and so this is, of course, a very wasteful implementation. Let's try and make this a little bit more efficient. This is actually explained in the MP3 standard. We start with the equation that expresses the output of the subband uh, number i as a convolution of the impulse response of the filter for that branch with the input. And here you see that the downsampling factor translates to a factor of 32 in front of the input index. We can now replace the expression for the impulse response of the filter as the prototype impulse response times the modulating factor that brings the filter to the proper position in the frequency band. And then here we're going to apply a little trick. We're going to express the index k as the sum of two indices. Namely, we're going to say that k is equal to 64 times an index p plus q, where p ranges from 0 to 63, and q ranges from 0 to 7. Okay? So with this split of the summation, we can write the previous line as a double summation for p that goes from 0 to 7 and for q that goes from 0 to 63 as the same term, uh, the modulation term that we've seen before, the prototype impulse response and the input. Where we have, again, we have made the substitution k is equal to 64p plus q. The trick allows us to simplify one of the terms in the modulating factor because this and this will multiply out to a multiple of pi and so we can eliminate that. And we have a simplified quote-unquote expression that looks like so. An outside sum here that only involves the cosine modulation and an inner sum here which is a pre-subsampled implementation of the filtering operation. If we work out the indices and convert this to an algorithmic procedure, this is what we need to do. We will use a 512 tap input circular buffer and we will shift at each step 32 new input audio samples starting from the newest. So at any time the circular buffer is holding 512 input samples in time reversed order. Then we take a new 512 point buffer and we fill it sample by sample with the product between the prototype impulse response and the content of the circular buffer. Next, we compute this intermediate quantity here, which is the sum of the contents of this new buffer, 64 points apart. We can do that for 63 different points. And if you do the math, there are seven points that we have summed together for each Q index. Finally, each subband output is given by this sum here, where we're taking the intermediate quantity C of Q that we computed before, and we modulate it with the cosines at the frequencies that we had defined in the beginning. And finally, quantization. This is where the great bitrate savings are going to be achieved. MP3 uses uniform quantization of subband samples. 
and the number of bits per sample in each subband is determined by the psychoacoustic model as we explained before. We also said before that MP3 works on subsequent audio frames, a frame being a window of input samples that is processed independently. There are 36 samples per band and per frame in the MP3 standard, and so since all of these 36 samples are going to be quantized by the same quantizer, a rescaling is needed so that we are using the full range of the quantizer. Remember how uniform quantization works? A quantizer maps an input interval to a set of quantization levels. Of course, you have to make sure that the range of your input signal matches the range of the quantizer. For instance, this quantizer expects the input to range from minus 1 to 1, but if your actual input only lives in this small sub-interval, you will not be able to make use of the full quantization range. So rescaling normally would imply perfect renormalization of the 36 samples by dividing the samples by the largest sample in magnitude. Of course, in order for the decoder to then reconstruct the actual levels of the input, we would have to send this normalization factor alongside with the quantized data. But this would require a lot of side information. We would use 16 or 32 bits to encode the normalization factor and send it along. Instead, the MPEG standard defines 16 predefined scale factors. We will choose the one that best matches the actual range of the input and only use 4 bits to communicate this range to the decoder thanks to the fact that these predefined levels are set in stone. Finally, the actual quantization is performed according to this formula where B is the number of bits as provided by the psychoacoustic model and QA and QB functions of the number of bits are parameters that are encoded inside the MP3 standard. Finally, let's listen to some examples. We all know that MP3 works very well, so what we want to concentrate on here is the importance of the variable bit allocation across the subbands as performed by the psychoacoustic model. So for a fixed bit budget, we could choose to allocate the same number of bits to all subbands. This would be uniform bit allocation, or we could use a psychoacoustic model and allocate the bits smartly across subbands. And so here are the examples, starting with the original signal. Now let's listen to the same signal encoded with uniform bit allocation. And finally, this is the result of a full-fledged MP3 implementation with psychoacoustically based bit allocation. Of course, in both the uniform and non-uniform bit allocation encoding schemes, the target bit rate was very, very low in order to exacerbate the effects of quantization. But the principle holds for all bit rates.